Hello, everybody, and welcome to today's event, Keeping the Peace on Social Media, How the Lima Police Department in Ohio Uses Social Media Archiving to Solve Crimes and Enforce Their Social Media Policy. Welcome today, everybody. My name is Morgan Wright. I'm a senior fellow uh, for government technology. Uh, in keeping the fact that this is coming out, out of Ohio and the Republican National Convention will be there this weekend. I was the senior law enforcement advisor in 2012 for the Republican National Convention. So for you folks in Ohio, you know, stay safe this weekend. Uh, but I'm also excited to serve as a moderator for today's event. Just want to say thank you for joining us. We're going to have a lot of fun over the next 60 minutes. This is some great stuff. We've been having a lot of good conversations before you all join the line. So before we begin, just a couple of brief housekeeping notes. Uh, a recording of this presentation will be emailed to everybody within 48 hours. So if you're worried about it, don't worry. You can use the recording for your reference or folks, pass it along, share it with your friends and colleagues. Now, this is designed to be interactive. You'll see a Q&A button down at the bottom. Please send us your questions between Andy and Neil and myself. We want to make sure we get your questions as many as we can answered today. So and if you'd like to download a PDF of the slides for the presentation, you can do so by clicking on the webinar resources widget down at the bottom of your console. Also, you'll be able to connect with your peers. Just use hashtag GovTechLive on Facebook and Twitter and any of your preferred social media platforms. And at the close of this, folks, you're going to get a brief survey. We encourage you, please fill out that survey. This is how we make improvements. We've already made some improvements. Uh, we've had some new sessions come out based on your feedback. So if you can't stay, just make sure you fill it out when you leave. Otherwise, uh, it'll pop up once the webinar concludes. So at this time, disable your pop-up blockers, strap in, hold on, because you're going to have some fun. If you have any issues, Brandon from On24, our crack technical staff, will be there to answer any of your questions. Just just put them in the chat box and we will get there with you. Otherwise, click help at the bottom. So folks, I'm very excited because joining me today to talk about this is Lieutenant Andrew C. Green. He's the Patrol Services and the Public Information Officer for the Lima Police Department and Neil Chavla. He's the Founder and Chief Executive Officer for Archive Social. So real quick, uh, here's what we're going to do. I'm going to speak for just a couple minutes. We're going to talk about social media by the numbers. We're going to do, uh, I'm going to introduce Andy and then we're going to do a quick poll. So make sure you stay tuned for that. Then we'll talk about his presentation called Navigating Our Way to Social Media Success. We'll do, uh, I'll introduce Neil. We'll do another poll. He'll talk about the legal aspects of social media use, and then stay tuned because we're going to do some live Q&A. So let me just kick this off real quick. Let's talk about social media by the numbers. When I say numbers, I'm serious. It's just three numbers that I want to talk about, one, two, and three. And you'll see for each section there's one thing, two things, and three things I want to talk about. So what's the first thing we want to talk about? Well, look, the first thing we want to talk about is what really social media all, is all about, folks, and that is the First Amendment of the Bill of Rights. This is social media has probably brought to the forefront in a way unlike any other technology the issue of First Amendment. What can you say? What can't you say? How do you moderate? What do you do? So this, these are all key critical issues for the use of social media, not just in public safety, as you've seen um, with the horrendous events in Dallas, uh, where we had uh, San Bernardino, you look at Boston, social media, whether you like it or not, is playing a critical event. And so the importance of freedom of speech and how you get that information out is going to be critical to this. So the second piece we want to talk about is uh, two things that in our work here uh, at Government Technology and in the Center for Digital Government, we, did, we do surveys every two years of states, and we survey a lot of issues. And we found two of the most common things that citizens want, that people want from their government, are first – transparency. They want to know that processes are transparent. What you're doing is transparent. Access to information is transparent. So really, social media provides transparency in a way that hasn't been done before. And then the next thing they want is accountability. They want to know that they can hold their government officials, their elected officials accountable. You know, They want to be able to see results. So you're seeing that social media now has really turned the tables on that. Now, quickly, for the third thing I want to talk about, three things on here. I, you know, one of the things that I've talked about when I do, uh, when I've worked with the government, when I've worked with Congress, testified before, we talk about what are some of the key issues, especially with all of these new things coming out. Well, folks, first thing is policy. If you don't have a policy in place, if you don't know what it is you want to do, don't bother deploying the technology because it will be a losing uh, venture. You've got to make sure the first thing you do is define the outcome. What is it you want out of it, whether it's social media, a body cam, um, a new computer, whatever it is, what's your policy for use on that? 
after you figure out the policy, well, then guess what? Training dog says it's just like exactly what it is. Bathing is like training. Neither one is permanent, and you can usually tell when it hasn't been done in a while. So if you want to change behavior, you've got to do the training. So make sure that once you have a policy in place, you train people on what to do, and then, and only then, to get to the really wicked stuff. Uh, before you came on board, the lieutenant and I were having some good conversations about the military. We have some stuff in common with aviation. This is the F-117 stealth fighter. I guarantee you nobody gets into the cockpit of one of those without first going through all the policies, then going through lots of training before they actually let you loose on the technology. And to close this out, if this is Facebook, then you're doing it wrong. So uh, just your social media uh, advice of the day. So, hey, look, let's kick this off. Let's do this because the most important part is now about to come. Let's talk about Andrew Green. Andy Green is a lieutenant at the Lima, Ohio Police Department. He has 17 years of service with the LPD and is assigned as a shift commander in the Patrol Services Division. Now, Lieutenant Green is the agency's public information officer, the PIO, and he's manager of the agency social media program. Now, Lieutenant Green is the commander of the Community Oriented Policing Unit, which I have uh, a long history with community policing. It's, that's great work, folks. I'll tell you, now needed more than ever. And he's the school resource officer program. He's additionally assigned as the commander of the agency's bike patrol unit and he recently left their SWAT unit where he served as assistant team commander after 12 years. But I'll tell you, this is one of the most important things, though, is that when he's also employed by Police Technical LLC, the national instructor for, of course, social media methods for law enforcement, but we talked about where he did this, and he'll tell you a little bit about his background with how he came up with this, and he's spoken to lots of audiences about the topic of integrating social media into local government. So let's get to the first question. So here's the first question, folks. Um, we need to know what is your opinion on social media as a public record. It definitely is a public record by law. It might be a record, but you don't think your activity is worth retaining. You feel strongly that it is not a public record, or you don't know. So it's definitely a public record. It might be a record, but your activity isn't worth retaining. You feel strongly it's not a public record, or you don't know. So let's get your votes in there, and let's see what they say. Well, it's pretty clear. 83% of you think it is a public record. Only about 4% think it might be a record but not worth retaining. Uh, nobody feels strongly that it is not a public record, and about 12% don't know. So that's actually a pretty good start. So look, folks, I want you to strap in. I think you're going to enjoy this next part. So, Lieutenant Green, the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, glad to be here. Um, asked to talk just a little bit about uh, – the program we have at Lima Police Department for our social media program and uh, how it was born and, and where we're hoping it's going to go. We're active on uh, several platforms, Instagram, Facebook, Twitter. We're using Snapchat a little bit. Uh, Nextdoor is big for us and Pinterest. And uh, believe it or not, we actually do know how to use each one of those platforms that we're, that we're figuring out along the way. Uh, where we came from... This all started while I was deployed in Afghanistan. So I did a, a year in Afghanistan between 2011 and 2012. As you can imagine, uh, soldiers overseas have a lot of spare time on their hands. Uh, in between doing the things that I was supposed to do there, I had a lot of time to look around on the Internet. And as I was doing that, I saw police departments across the country embracing social media. I saw it working for agencies in California, uh, Wichita, Kansas, and just everywhere throughout the country. And at the time, it was something that we weren't doing at all. So when I came back in late 2012, I approached the chief of police, and I, I came up with a plan that I thought was a good plan to launch social media in Lima. I took it to the chief, and he I'm not going to say he wasn't excited about it, but uh, he, he told me I could give it a shot. So he gave us a, a six-month trial. And uh, and he tells this story everywhere he goes now that uh, he likes to to give everybody a chance to I guess fail, and and we can learn something that way. But he gave me six months, and he he'll tell you that after two weeks he decided that it wasn't going anywhere and it was only going to grow. So things have been very successful with us for that. Um, Facebook was first, and then Twitter followed shortly after that. A little bit about the Lima Police Department. We have an authorized strength of 86 sworn officers. Uh, just like most police departments of our size, we do not have the, the ability to have a full-time public information officer. So somebody at agencies like ours is usually filling that role. Here it was me filling this role 
based on me doing the social media. So I kind of jumped on the grenade and said, hey, I, I will do this. I want to do this, and I've embraced it. Um, it started out just like most agencies my size starting to do social media, realized or, or started doing everything myself, working on it at home, working on it during in between calls, anytime I had a chance working on it, it was very overwhelming. I managed to get several officers, uh, some dispatchers, and some civilian staff that have agreed to help with that, and we've definitely spread the load, which has been very, very helpful. So we now are managing uh, several Facebook pages, uh, some Twitter accounts, and all the other social media platforms that we do. We recently created uh, Facebook pages for our school resource officers, which has been very successful because they are integrated into the schools, working with the kids there, and they're able to share positive stories that they're learning or that they're that they're working on throughout their school, and then we can then share that content on a larger scale on our agency page. Uh, this screenshot was taken a little while ago that showed our, our current user count, 28,652. I checked it this morning. We're at 29,000. I'm hoping maybe this will push us over 30,000. But uh, what I wanted to show was down at the bottom where Facebook, as you guys know, has been kind of tagging your responsiveness on private messages. That's been very important to us because we realize that uh, social media is two-way communication, and the way we do our two-way communication the best to get information from the public is through our private messages. So we strive very hard to answer those messages as quickly as possible. Um, that screenshot said we had a nine-minute response time. Of course, it, it varies and goes up and down with that, but we take it very seriously and, and we try to communicate back and forth with the public. I want to share some reasons why, if your agency is not already doing social media, that you should be. First one is reach. And uh, I tell this story, and this this screenshot comes out of an incident that happened on September 11th, 2014, we had a prison escape here in Lima. And the guy on the right there is TJ Lane. He has a little bit of notoriety for uh, being a school shooter from Chardon, Ohio. He and a couple of his buddies escaped out of Allen Oakwood Correctional Institute. And on September 11th, 2014, we did have Facebook. Um, however, it was there wasn't a lot going on there for us, really. Um, when this happened, as you can imagine, the public was was rather upset, rather nervous, and no real information was going out from the, from the agencies that were handling that. Uh, we jumped in and put out a few basic posts through our uh, Twitter and Facebook feeds, just trying to allow people to understand what was going on, uh, to answer some of the questions that the many questions that were coming in to, through 911 and to our dispatch center and just kind of put out good information. As you can see on the in the middle there under post reach, we reached 1.1 million people with that post. And I ask, I ask our guys the question, when was the last time you put out a news release in the city of Lima and reached 1.1 million people? Never was the answer to that. So there's a large reach that we're able to get with our social media platforms. Another reason you should be doing this is transparency. Transparency right now is extremely important. People want to to know what is really going on with your agency. So we like to show citizens that we're real people. We'll show our officers doing fun things. Um, just show them the, the boring parts of the job too and get news of our agency out. But we're upfront about the good things that are happening and we, we, uh, we'll talk about the bad things that happen also. Something that's important to us is making sure we're actually connecting with our citizens. Uh, if you haven't used Facebook Insights, you can jump on there and you can see exactly who you're connecting with and where they're from. Uh, at the time I took this screenshot, it, it showed that the city with the largest amount of our Facebook followers was Lima and in the United States, which is important to us because if we're not reaching our citizens, we're not achieving our goal. Um, it would be great to have a million followers, but if there are a million followers throughout the country or throughout the world, that's not helpful to me. I really want to reach the citizens in my community. 
solving crime. We've uh, captured several wanted persons, identify criminals, shoplifting, things like that, uh, tips. That's where it's been big for us. So, And most of our tips come in through private message, which I already talked about. That is why it is very important that um, we follow up on all of those private messages that come in, pay attention to them, respond to them, and let them know that they do have an avenue to reach us through private conversation, and they can provide information to us that we do appreciate. I want to showcase uh, this crime right here. This is this was one that really set it off for us back in January of 2013, and this is where I really realized the power that social media had in uh, solving crime. And what this was is uh, these two guys in this photo went into a Speedway gas station and they committed a minor theft offense. They stole the donation jar for like uh, one of the charities off of the counter. The clerk never saw it, didn't know it happened until approximately an hour later they noticed it was missing, reviewed the video, and, and realized that they had the theft caught on tape. Officers went out there, and at that time, we handled it just like we had handled uh, multiple thefts prior to that, tried to have officers at the station identify. Uh, we were unsuccessful with that. I managed to get a hold of the video and put these still shots on our uh, social media platform. It was Facebook at the time. And within just a few minutes, we had both of those subjects identified by name, knew exactly who they were, how to find them so charges could be filed on them. It was at that moment that I really realized the power that we had at our fingertips with social media. Another case happened uh, just this year, and it was the case of a, a missing child that had autism. Uh, we weren't notified about the missing child for over an hour after it happened, so the trail to find him was pretty cold at that point. We had officers out searching on foot, but based on these two social media posts that we put out, uh, they reached 84, 85,000 people in the, in the local area, and we were able to track him down based on a citizen who observed him walking on the railroad tracks earlier in the in the morning saw the Facebook post later, and then said, hey, I remember that kid, came back, called. We were able to track him down. Um, it turned out this child walked over 17 miles on the railroad tracks out of Lima. He was captured, uh, or not captured, he was found north of Bluffton, Ohio, 17 miles away, and reunited safely with his family. Some things that we've learned. Uh, negative comments. Everybody's talking about negative comments. They are coming to your posts. Um, this post right here is one, um, an officer was retiring. He was getting his retirement badge, swearing in as an auxiliary officer when things like this come up. Negative comments that happen day after day, we started to get these as our Facebook page became more popular. It became a target for people to put negative comments on. It took a little while for us to figure out exactly how to deal with this, but it became apparent very quickly that we need to deal with it. So we learned that removal of content, should you do it? Yes, you should do that. However, it should be done within the reasonable confines of a terms of use statement, a social media policy that is approved by your agency and by your law department. Things that you should be removing, in my opinion, uh, profanity, threats, racial remarks, anything that can endanger your investigation, citizens, law enforcement, and things that are just off topic. We did a terms of use, and uh, we wanted to make sure that this was prominently displayed to where anyone could see this. So through some manipulation of Facebook settings, we put it right on the buttons with the, with the top of our Facebook page, Terms of Use. When you click on that button, it'll take you to our actual Terms of Use, which is right here, which spells out everything that we will remove content for. And it basically spells out what the purpose 
of the Facebook page is or the social media platform is. We're talking about public records. That was the, the poll question that came up. Uh, my answer for this poll question at the beginning would have would have been somewhere along the lines of, I am not sure if it's a public record or not. Well, I can tell you now that we figured out very quickly that our social media data is a public record. Uh, we were advised by the law director that we needed to start archiving our social media data immediately. This was a very big hurdle for us to overcome. Uh, we, we did figure out how to add that to our records retention schedule, and then we were going to have to figure out how we were going to um, get to that data and how we were going to store it. So the first method that we tried to use was a manual backup, which if you have ever done that, it is very, very time consuming, very, very difficult, and we learned that it doesn't catch everything. So what we did is we'd do a manual save of our entire Facebook page at the time um, as a web page. And we'd do that every month and download a copy of our Twitter archive, and we would store that also. It didn't work for us. Um, we realized, one, it was very time consuming. We missed a lot of stuff, such as content that was deleted we would, we would miss. We figured out that posts that have a large amount of comments in there, we would, we would miss some of the comments. And then there was the confusion, since we had multiple people working on the social media program, who was going to be the one to handle the backup of the data on any given month with vacations or, or whatever else was going on. We formed an exploratory team to try and figure out how we were going to do this. I was on that, a, uh, a representative from our law department, our city, data, our city data management team representative, who I believe is on this call, and uh, the mayor actually got together and we started researching companies to figure out who gave us the best product for what we were looking for. We did select Archive Social and we set up our entire city to use the package. And uh, I, along with some, some other people throughout the city, were set up as primary users. It has been uh, absolutely outstanding for us using Archive Social to this point. Um, and the last thing I have on here is a copy of a public records request that we received. So, and I was very thankful that at the time we we received public records requests such as this one. We were set up with Archive Social because gathering the information that we needed was very, very simple, where um, if we had tried to do it when we were doing it the old way, manually storing that, it could have been a problem. Well, Thank Andy, you. that was – hey, Ed, and look, folks, I, I sold I sold the Lieutenant Short. Actually, let me just add a couple. Number one, thank you for your service. Uh, besides that, uh, Lieutenant Green's also a chief warrant officer, too, in the Ohio Army National Guard, so he has served our country over in Afghanistan operation and during freedom, 20-year veteran, and also a member of the 82nd Airborne Division, so airborne there, soldier. Uh, thank you very much. So, hey, look, but stick around, you guys. Uh, you, you should have lots of questions. Let's get your questions in, uh, because as we get through Anil's presentation, you guys are going to see there's a lot of big issues here. So I have the honor now of introducing Anil Chavla. He's the founder and CEO of Archive Social. Now, it's the public sector's leading provider of technology to help government agencies archive, and folks, this is an important thing, manage risk related to social media. So Archive Social partnered with the state of North Carolina back in 2010 to launch the world's first open and interactive archive of social media. Since then, Archive Social has worked with hundreds of government agencies such as Springfield, Ohio, Montgomery, Ohio, the Ohio Department of Public Safety, and the world's largest law firm, yes, that is the U.S. Department of Justice, maintain records of social media for legal protection and for public records requirements, just, like, just as you saw Lieutenant Green put up there. So the company was selected for the prestigious Code for America Accelerator in 2013, recognized as a 2014 cool vendor in government by the leading analyst from Gartner, honored by GovTech 100 uh, as a GovTech 100 company earlier this year, and he's also the co-host of the, co the GovTech Social Podcast, of which I just had the honor of being on with Anil and gang, so thank you very much for that. 
Before we bring them on, though, guess what we have? We have our second round of questions here. So now we told you the what. You know, do you think it is a record? Now let's see if you are collecting it, how you're doing it. So how is your agency currently retaining records of social media? First, you're not retaining your own records and you rely on the networks. That means Twitter, Facebook, uh, YouTube, whatever it might be. You take manual captures, things like screenshots, copy and paste. You use a personal backup tool like Backupify, Social Safe, something along those lines. You have an automated solution for archiving. Or the fifth one, that you have, you are already a happy archive social customer, so you're not retaining, you rely on the network, you take manual captures, personal backup tool, automated solution, or you're already a customer. So let's see what people said there. Wow, 57% of you say that you're not retaining any of these records. Uh, 19% say uh, you take manual, that's time intensive like the lieutenant said. About 4% use a personal tool, 11% um, of you use an automated solution, and about 7.5% of you are already happy customers. So Anil, that sounds like uh, a good place for you to start, so the floor is yours. Well, Morgan, I have to agree, and I do appreciate the intro, uh, but most importantly, I want to thank Lieutenant Green on a number of fronts. Uh, obviously, your, your service to the country, your service to the city of Lima on a, on a daily basis, and then your participation today, uh, really outlining your story of, of why and how you started on social media, uh, how you've grown it. The specific examples were incredibly compelling in terms of finding the missing child, solving those crimes. It uh, really underscores the importance of social media. So thank you again for sharing your story uh, here today with the audience. And of course, thank you to the audience for participating. What I intend to do with the rest of this presentation is provide uh, a broader view of, of examples around social media as social media touches risk and liability. So I will be talking about a lot of legal cases. Uh, I'll be answering that question of social media as a public record for those of you who are still uncertain uh, and giving you some, some real some concrete examples there. Uh, and I'm going to do that with the intent of arming you with a solution. Uh, Lieutenant Green shared his story and, and, and their selection of archive social in full disclosure. We solved this problem for agencies, but there are, there are other options out there. And what I want to do is arm you all with the framework for how to think about this uh, issue of social media as a record and how that plays into managing risk, uh, and, then, and then allow your agency to make a decision on, on how to approach that moving forward. Uh, and in that note, I, of course, want to answer your question, so please use that Q&A window. Now, before I, I jump into all of this, uh, again, I will be talking about several legal circumstances yeah, in, in a way painting social media against a light of, 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 of challenges and, 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 and problems and I want to underscore that again and, and really reiterate what Lieutenant Green shared uh, earlier about social media being a critical cha channel for communicating with citizens. Uh, our country, as, as we all know, has been going through a rough set of weeks. And um, while many of you may be facing criticism on your social media today, it is unquestionable that social media provides a channel to connect with your citizens that hasn't existed before. Uh, and if you, if you go look at Lima's uh, Facebook page right now, you'll see how when, when the police department talks about the individuals there uh, in the department, uh, recently an individual winning, winning a Medal of Honor, uh, being awarded for their service, having that connection with your citizen also brings a lot of positivity uh, and allows the citizens to see you as people and not just an agency. And so social media is fundamentally a channel that, that's working for government, delivering lots of positive benefits. I'm going to highlight the legal issues and then talk about how you can be proactive to ensure those legal issues don't get in your way and don't bring you down. So with all of that, let's start with public records. Now, I'm really happy to see that the vast majority of you feel, understand that social media is a public record and, and believe that your social media should be managed as public record. For those of you who are still on the fence and, and trying to sort this out, it does go back to your Public Records Act in Ohio, where we have a lot of our attendees today. Uh, you have a Public Records Act, like most, uh, virtually all other states do, and much of the language is, is actually the same across many states. And the key in that, in that act, which was written decades ago, is that a, a government record is defined regardless of physical form. Uh, so what that means is that if you're receiving a crime tip, as, as Lima has received, it doesn't matter if that crime tip comes on a piece of paper or in an email or a Twitter direct message or a Facebook private message, a crime tip is a crime tip. And that interpretation uh, is what agencies are relying on across the country. And many records bodies in a vast majority of states have come around and said, yes, the Public Records Act that was written decades ago that covers our email, covers social media in, in very much the same way. Now, in Ohio itself, uh, at least one instance of, of an evaluation of this is with the Ohio Electronic Records Committee. And this is 
an evaluation that was done a few years ago. So this may be an ongoing topic with the committee, but even back then, uh, they produced this document, and we've included a link to that document discussing how social media creates records and the importance of, of managing social media as a record. So I encourage you to check out this guidance from, from your own state um, to, to further uh, validate that social media is a record and, and that your agency should be doing something to manage that record. So let's talk about real social media records. And again, I have to credit Lieutenant Green for, for sharing some, some really nice, uh, clear examples uh, of how social media has impact and the communications have impact. I'll, I'll share some more here. And where I'm going to start, uh, you know, we had some animations on the slide that's lost, so apologies for the jumble here. But uh, right at the top with the Orlando police, now the situation in Orlando is a horrific incident, and it's quite fresh and raw for, for many of us. But I, I want to bring it up because it, it, it directly you know, relays the value of social media in government, particularly in terms of public safety. Uh, when the shootings uh, occurred in Orlando in the middle of the night, one of the first things that Orlando police did was go on Twitter and say, well, we're going to provide official updates on this Twitter feed. No email and phone calls, please. It is incredibly overwhelming, as many of you know, in a, in a crisis uh, in terms of the media, the citizens reaching out to you. And having a channel where you can broadcast information to the public, be very transparent, be very frequent in that transparency, is extraordinarily powerful. And that's why we're seeing public agencies use that in crisis situations, both big and small. Again, Orlando was, was a massive crisis, but every community faces some level of crisis. And so these are the situations where social media has a lot of value, but they're also, social media is also going to generate records that you have to retain and, and think about managing. Um, as we go around this, this, this set of examples in a clockwise direction, it may be that something happens not in the physical world, but in the virtual world. In South Daytona uh, last year, a photo went viral when a, when a dog's mouth was duct taped. Now, this is nothing that the city did, but it happened in, in somewhat of a relation to the city because a woman who used to live in the city posted it. And so it got tagged as, as coming from South Daytona, and it created an outcry, and it overwhelmed this small city of, of roughly 12,000 population. And so this creates a crisis situation, again, where the city had to provide frequent updates to inform citizens of how they were uh, approaching this issue, the fact that law enforcement was working to track this, the citizen down. Social media played a huge role in, in, in turning the crowd from being against the city and being uh, having an outcry to the city congratulating the South Daytona police on, on how they were able to work with law, law enforcement across the country to track this woman down who posted that photo. On the bottom, my hometown city of Durham, where Archive Social is located, uh, 911 went out for a portion of the citizens. And the only way then at that point that the city felt that to effectively inform people was to use Twitter um, and, and, and give them an a alternate means to reach 911. And finally, on the left slide, outside of public safety situations, crisis situations, day-to-day, -day, every government agency, if you're on social media, fundamentally you're performing some kind of customer service. You're informing citizens, hopefully you're responding to them, hopefully you're clarifying your questions, hopefully you're directing them in, in the right direction. And uh, there's an example from Austin's code department where a sidewalk needed to be uh, mowed and, and they responded back to it and asked for a photo and so forth. And social media is incredibly powerful for having that information move very quickly and having issues addressed. But we have to remember that all, all these instances I've highlighted, these are instances where social media does create records of value. Not everything on your social media needs to be retained as a public record, but social media absolutely creates public records. So with that, the next question is, well, when is somebody asking for these records and why don't they just go to Facebook and Twitter? And again, Lieutenant Green provided a perfect example uh, that they've dealt with in Lima. Um, we have another example here, but the broader, the broader picture I want to paint for you is that social media is one communications pipeline for you. It's one communications tool that your city and your agencies are using uh, in a broad mix of communications tools, but more and more it's becoming one of the most prominent and while you may never have re received a public records request specifically asking for Twitter or Facebook content, it's very likely that you, if you are receiving public records requests, that you're receiving public records requests that now include your social media communications. So some examples are any and all documents, all reports of the incident, all notifications of the street closure, all emails and communications. So I encourage you to think about the types of records requests you've received and then think about how social media has touched those incidents and determine whether social media communications would have fallen under that records request and what you can do better to, to really fulfill that request moving forward. And that's where a lot of our customers have seen value in, in ensuring that they are complete in their response, particularly because social media can be used in these, these crisis or emergency situations. 
So with that, that hopefully uh, gives us a baseline of social media as a record, uh, particularly as a public record and how public records are generated on social networking channels. I want to share just a handful of case studies from our customer base. These are incidents that, that were not national news. And just like the situation where Lima received a public records request, it's really helpful to understand when social media is requested as a record. I'm going to start uh, here in, uh, on the East Coast with uh, Vineland Police Department in New Jersey. And now this is a, a city that uh, a town that had been instructed by their attorney to actually turn off Facebook comments. Now you can't actually do that. There is no toggle on Facebook to simply turn off comments. But with a lot of effort, you can put up filters and keywords and so forth to, to ensure that you have the ability to immediately go and, and hide comments before they really show up on your Facebook page. And so the police department was instructed to do this. They followed through. And a citizen noticed that his comments were being hidden and actually contacted the police department and said, I am going to issue a public records request for everything that you're hiding. I think you're hiding, you're, you're hiding something because you're hiding something. So I'm going to issue a public records request every month until you stop hiding information. Um, and I'm really suspicious of why you're hiding all this content. And he actually followed through and began issuing a public records request once a month. Now, Vineland initially did not have an archiving solution in place. And so it was manually going through Facebook, going through all of the comments they had and taking screenshots, spending hours upon hours, putting this together and responding. And it was a, it was a complete distraction, very time consuming, um, and ultimately decided to employ archiving technology. Now, if you think about this with archiving technology in place, and you have a citizen that's doing this to you, and it's no longer a distraction. With a few clicks and a few minutes of time, you can respond and move on with your day. And, and, and likely, as we've seen with other customers, stop those requests from coming in. On the opposite side of the country, Santa Barbara's police department was uh, following through on a city on a city program, which was a gun buyback program. Now, that's a very controversial topic. And on Facebook, as they were t uh, disclosing this event was happening, the controversy broke out. And Santa Barbara was not archiving initially, but fortunately, they, our sales team had contacted them. And they were, had been discussions and they actually started a free trial off our website. And within three weeks of that free trial, um, one week before it ended, the National Rifle Association issued a public information request for all of the communications related to that gun buyback. And we actually published a case study through government technology on this. Uh, Santa Barbara, of course, moved ahead with uh, not only responding to that public records request with their free trial, but they moved ahead with having an archiving solution in place from here on out. Um, and, and in the case study, if you check it out, you'll see that the police officer talks about how, uh, how worried he was that he would be able to produce the information and produce it accurately. And this is a National Rifle Association. This is not just a single citizen, but this is a, a powerful entity, and you want to get this right. Unfortunately, he was able to get that record response right, and nothing came out of it. So those are two situations involving public records requests. So I want to highlight one more. This is in Spokane, Washington. It actually has nothing to do with public records requests. This is a situation where the city had been promoting a kayaking trip for a long time. This was an annual event. And unfortunately, a young man died on one of the kayaking events. Now, the city was just one of the actors in promoting this event. But the lawsuit for that death came back and said, you know, this, this kayaking trip shouldn't have happened. We want to see all the information about the weather conditions uh, and notices that had been shared about this event. And they actually asked the city of Spokane to produce two years worth of Facebook posts related to promoting that kayaking event. Now, you'll see the case study with government technology again where in, in Washington, there are strict rules about responding to public records requests in a timely fashion. And in the case study, they talk about how they're, they're, without an archiving uh, solution in place ahead of time, uh, in, they may not have been able to respond in a timely fashion or a complete fashion. So really important to be proactive. It really saved the city. And the big thing here is that every single city, county, every department shares information about events. This is not an unusual thing to do, and it's fairly innocuous. But social media touches everything you do as an agency and think this affects people's lives and it can lead to legal circumstances. And again, you want to be in a position where you are proactive enough to be able to respond quickly and move on and it doesn't hamper all the benefits and advantages that you get out of having a social presence. So in order to do that, uh, Lieutenant Green talked about moving away from a manual process to archiving. Again, uh, a lot of agencies still are using screenshots. I know about 20% of you are using manual captures. Uh, you know, it's worth taking account of how much, how many of your hours you're spending to do that and then how complete you're able to be. And, and I've found that uh, talking to individuals that to be really comprehensive in, screen, in screenshotting is 20 to 30 hours a month 
uh, on a very modest social media presence. And even then, information can be uh, lost or, or missed. And the moment you take a screenshot, a new comment can come in after that. So I'm going to focus here on, on automation uh, and, and, again, lay out a, a framework for you to think about because there are many options out there. Now, one really important point to make is around this content being on Facebook or Twitter or not being there. And I know about 60% of you responded to that poll saying that currently you're relying on the social networks. Uh, that's, that's a reasonable thing to do give, if you're not doing anything else because, you know, you assume that Facebook and Twitter would never lose your data. But you have to think about how that data can be removed or lost. And Archive Social actually conducted a study on this in January of 2016. We we're really curious to answer this question. So we actually sampled 400 government agencies that we work with that we archive on a daily basis or, or on a continuous basis throughout the day. And we monitored to see how much content was being deleted or lost from Facebook. Now, we have the technology today to detect deletions. And as deletions happen, we actually tag that in, in the archive. And so we use the same technology. We found that in one month, nearly 7,800 records were lost or deleted from Facebook for those 400 customers. Not every customer was affected, but 75% or three out of four customers had at least one deletion. Several customers had dozens of deletions. Now, if you talk to these customers, most of them are not aware of the, of the number of deletions that happen because most of the time it's not your staff, it's not your agency deleting anything. In fact, in fact with citizen comments, you're probably just hiding them and not deleting them. But citizens are deleting quite a lot. Uh, we talked about crime tips. Nothing stops a citizen from sending you a crime tip in a private message and then changing their minds and deciding not to, they, won't, they don't want to be associated with that, deleting that private message to you, and that record being lost forever, and you've now lost a crime tip. So something to think about, and we are continuing to monitor this, and, and some agencies have hundreds of deletions uh, a month, and, and uh, you may not even know how much content is being lost. It's a, it's a normal thing on the Internet to have information decay and information loss. Uh, and so this is why you need to take information into your control, have the records in your control. In fact, in many states, um, in the records guidelines, um, agencies are now saying that for you to comply with the public records law, you need to have control of the data. It can't just be on the platform. So how do you do that? Well, I'm going to give you some best practices here. And uh, it does come to, down to having some form of social media archiving technology. Again, that is what we do, but it, we're not the only ones that do this. Uh, but it's something that we care about deeply, and it's our primary focus. So. Uh, I'm going to give you some guidelines here. When, when we built our product and, and as we continue to improve our product, what we've come up with the four important factors of, of archiving social media, and this is a little different than dealing with email or files because, again, this data is out of your control. To start with, you need to be as frequent as possible getting this data in your hands. Because it's on Facebook and Twitter and because it's being deleted and lost, as we just saw, uh, the longer you take to capture it, the more likely you are to lose important information. So how frequently can you get the data? That's one, one factor to consider. Comprehensiveness. Uh, a lot of vendors that were in the archiving space, particularly coming out of email archiving and website archiving, put together archiving solutions uh, a few years ago. But they were taking shortcuts because you know, email was their main focus. So they thought, maybe we'll grab a Facebook feed and turn it into email. Or we can archive websites. So let's just point our, our website archiving solution at Facebook.com. And what happened was that these, these vendors came out with these solutions that were capturing very incomplete records. They were only getting the surface level information. They weren't capturing the information when it changed. They weren't acknowledging the fact that social media has conversations that live and breathe and change over time. And they weren't getting what's called metadata, which is information that's associated with the record. And we'll look at that in more detail here in a second. The other aspect about taking screenshots or, or using uh, any kind of technology that converts the data is that you lose authenticity. So if you have this record and now you're taken to a legal situation and that record is challenged, you really want to be able to stand by that record. So if you're taking a screenshot and you take that to court as evidence and someone challenges it and says, well, that was Photoshopped or that was put together somehow, some other way, that wasn't really what happened, how do you prove it? And so authenticity is really critical. Having that electronic record, not only in a complete fashion, but an authentic fashion that you can stand by. And then context, which I'm going to talk about here in more detail as well, is um, really calling out the fact that a lot of archiving vendors talk to you about grabbing the data and storing it but they don't talk to you a whole lot about really producing it and making sense of it. And you really have to focus on that with social media because it's a conversation, it's rich, uh, it's complicated. And we'll look at some examples here. So to start with, I want to come back to that comprehensiveness uh, uh, you know, point here. And remind folks that Facebook's now been around for about a dozen years, 2004. In fact, this is a screenshot of the original Facebook.com. So <laughs> the website's come a long way. 
But what you want to look for in an archiving solution, uh, particularly if you're not archiving at this moment, but you start archiving, say, in the next week or next month or next few months, is an archiving solution that goes back and gets everything that it can possibly still get uh, off the social network and by communicating with the social network. Now, archiving solutions like Archive Social do that. Um, we can't get absolutely everything. If something was deleted, it's gone. If the network, for some reason, won't provide it to us anymore, we can't get it. But uh, with Facebook, most of the time, we can go back to the inception of a Facebook page and get all that data. So you want to look for that in any archiving solution so that you have a baseline and you're not missing out on tens or hundreds of thousands of communications from the you know, years that you've been on Facebook and these other sites. You also want to make sure that your archiving solution captures everything that's important, especially from a public record standpoint. So this is a view of, of content off of Twitter. Twitter is not just the Twitter, the feed, but it's the direct messaging. It's what you favorite because that could look like an endorsement. It's the mentions you receive from your citizens. It's even your profile information because that's your, what, what you say about yourself. So thinking about being very complete with, with those records. And then finally, in terms of frequency, getting it as fast as possible. Again, we have technology now where Facebook delivers content to us in real time. Uh, other networks, they don't always do that. But you know, look for an archiving vendor that's pushing the needle there and trying to capture content, not just once a day or uh, you know, a few, out, few times a day, but throughout the hour capturing content to protect you and, and uh, eliminating potential for data loss. Now, in terms of being comprehensive, I mentioned this idea of metadata. A really clear example here is with a tweet. We all know that a tweet at most is 140 characters. But if you look at the electronic record of that tweet, again, this is when you talk to Facebook or uh, Twitter servers and you say, Twitter, give us the data on this tweet, there's more than 2,000 characters of information that describe the tweet, information like IDs and timestamps and location information. So screenshotting, all you're going to get is that 140 characters. You're not going to get this metadata. And there are now, uh, there are multiple states where the Supreme Court in those states has ruled that metadata is just as much as part of the public record as the content itself. So something to think about in terms of your archiving solutions. And something I, I can't emphasize enough, in terms of context uh, in archiving, it's not as simple as grabbing Facebook and storing it somewhere, grabbing Twitter and storing it somewhere. At, at a surface level, every, uh, there are lots of archiving solutions that can grab some level of data from the social networks and store it. But it, the devil is in the details. And anyone who's been in a public record situation or a legal situation will tell you that it comes down to the details. And you want to look for really nitpicky details. Uh, looking at Facebook.com, now you can comment on top of comments. Comments can come in at any time. You can include multimedia within comments. And so there's a lot of complexity to these social networks. And so you want to look for an archiving solution that pays attention to these details and gets every bit of data that it can possibly get and stays on top of these changes. A vendor that's working on social media has to be ready to, to uh, react quickly as Facebook and Twitter are constantly, and these other sites are constantly changing their technology. So that's really important. Uh, and one more example of details is, you know, wh where does the archiving solution go in terms of giving you complete context around your record? So if it's a tweet, we know that tweets have lots of short URLs and tiny URLs and bit.ly's and owlies. So look for solutions that, that really try to give you enough context about that record to make sense of it. A uh, great example here with Archive Social is every tweet that we process, if it has a, anything that looks like a short URL, we'll figure out what that short URL actually points to. Because four years from now, that hourly might not be valid anymore, but you should know that this record pointed to something on your website and know exactly which page it, web, it pointed to and have that information. Now, outside of that detail uh, of having the, the imagery and uh, the context of you know, the URLs, what they point to, we have to remember that social media is a conversation and it's a timeline. And so when you do have to produce records, oftentimes you're going to find a specific comment or a specific message. And that comment or message alone really doesn't, doesn't really satisfy your needs because you need the full conversation. So when you're looking at record keeping solutions for social media and archiving, look for the ability to replay, not just retrieve data, but replay your social media. In this case, this is, a face, this is an Instagram comment, I should say, not a Facebook comment. So other networks, not just Facebook, have complexity. It's Instagram, and you want to be able to replay that in a way that you can make sense of it and see that entire thread. And finally, it is about getting that data out. You may find it in, the, in your archiving solutions interface, and then when you need to give it to a journalist or the National Rifle Association or an attorney or anyone else who's requesting it, uh, look at how you can get the data out. Some solutions might just give you an Excel export. Well, that's not that helpful for social media. PDF, we found, is a real standard for, for public sector in terms of sharing information. And let's say you did a public records request on a certain keyword. You found dozens upon dozens of comments and posts related to it. 
And some of those comments were actually on the same conversation. And maybe out of the 55 uh, results that you found, there's really like five conversations represented. Look for a solution that pieces it back together for you, not only on the website, but in a PDF. It gives you a PDF with all that laid out, highlighted, and so forth, so you can just hand this off. Because these are the attributes that we found over time that really save time, save money, and also reduce risk. Because if you do hand this information to somebody and it's not clear, then there's this big back and forth. And that really does so suck up your time and it leads to additional risk. So that's what we're looking for uh, in archiving solutions. These are the areas that we focus on and, and, and uh, you know, have heard from agencies are really important to them. The last thing I'll leave you with is that an archive doesn't just have to be about record keeping. We found more and more that archiving social media is something that's important for the communicator. It's important for folks like Lieutenant Green who are actually posting the social media and managing it. And so with an archive, uh, I want to highlight some technology that's now possible, something that we're doing is providing active alerting and monitoring on the social media content to alert you of pilot policy violations. So if you do have profanity, personally identifying information show up on your social media, we can alert you of that now. Uh, we can give that to you in an email. You see this is a screenshot of what that email looks like so you can act on it very quickly. And then having alerting and analytics to really understand what's happening in that archive data. That's really helpful from a communication standpoint, um, even to the point that we're now rating the content for how positive or negative it is. So you can stay, stay attuned to how your citizens are responding to your content. So again, these are capabilities that come out of having records because that's data and out of data comes insight. And I'll wrap up here real quick. Uh, at Archive Social, our goal, our goal is to be a resource to you. So whether or not you decide to work with us, I want, to, I want you to be aware that we have many free resources for government, uh, social media policy templates, guides around moderating comments and so forth. This is what we do. We are nearly 100% focused on government and nearly 100% focused on government social media. And on that note, all the technology I talked about that we sell that is a commercial offering from us, we also have a pro bono effort. If your agency finds itself in crisis, uh, take Orlando, for example, the recent shootings, hopefully no nothing like that ever happens to you. But if you have a crisis situation like a shooting, act of terrorism, a natural disaster, and you do not have any kind of archiving technology in place, we will provide 100% of our capabilities to you for free for 30 days with no strings attached other than your feedback. Uh, at no cost, again, to help you out. Um, we want to protect you from public records requests. We want to protect you from legal circumstances if you're dealing with a crisis, because we believe that your social media protects your citizens, uh, and it's the right thing to do. So with that, here's my contact information, and I'm here to answer your questions. Uh, Neil, great job. Hey, and folks, we appreciate um, all of your questions that are coming in. So we've got about 10 minutes set aside now for Q&A, so if you have anything, Make sure that you get it to us. You guys capture that information. If not, it will be in the replay that comes out. So, folks, real quickly, we're, uh, like I said, we're 10 minutes away. So you've, a lot of you have asked about getting copies today. Yes, within 48 hours, we'll provide everybody with a link to the recording. You'll also be able to download the slides at the PDF down at the bottom. Hey, but guys, let's dive into some of the questions. So um, the first one, this should be a real easy one. So, um, Andy, we want to get this over to you, but somebody said, where did you post the terms of reference for the Facebook page? I think you said you found a way to manipulate it, put it right on the front of the Facebook page. Is that right? Yeah, what we did is is we put that into a Facebook tab, and we did that through an ex external website. and. There's several different companies that you can use to do that. We used, and it's it, it's all free. But we use one called WooBox, and created an actual tab, put the content on there in HTML format, so it it put it on there and mimicked one of the buttons that you would you would press for either the About tab or Photos tab or or any of that. And as, and as soon as you clicked on that, it would bring up an external window that would show our terms of use in a text format that it could be read. Uh, it was important for us to do that because you could put it right out there prominently displayed for people to be able to see that. And we often would point people to that to say, hey, have you seen our terms of use? If not, click the button at the top of the page. Oh, great. Hey, Anil, we've got one for you. This one comes from, uh, I believe it's Jason Kelleher, Lorain County. And this is actually a good one that's been brought up before. It said, under general settings, Facebook allows you to download a copy of your page. And he's saying he did that for the first time today. Is this not adequate? Jason, great question. Both Facebook and Twitter and potentially other networks provide some kind of download feature. Uh, and last, we continue to check this, and I'd encourage you to check the download that you got today. Uh, what we found, there's, there's really two major issues and, and major problems, uh, and we call them gaps with that approach. The first is that download feature only gives you what's still there. It's not really an archive, but it's more of a snapshot. So 
So we talked about data being lost and deleted over time. Anything that's been lost from your page or deleted is not going to be in that download. So that's the first major issue. The second issue, which is a, a really big concern um, from the last time that we've, we've verified this download, is that Facebook is very cognizant of user privacy. They have not designed this for compliance purposes. This is for anybody to use for any reason. And for, for, for that fact, they have limited this download to really only your posts. And so it excludes all the third-party comments, which, yes, those are public records. This is information sent or received, right? And so that, all that commentary from third parties is completely missing from that download. Again, it's something I'd ask you to verify today. But if you're missing that third-party content, then that's really where a lot of the issues come out of in terms of public records requests and legal situations. And that's why it's not sufficient. And that's great. And, guys, this here's a question for both of you. Um, uh, so, Andy, this is for you just from simply – how you handled it, and, and Anil, then what Archive Social does. But uh, we've got William Kramer from Norwood Police Department. He's saying, is there any reason you simply cannot take a screenshot of your post and keep a paper copy? And Andy, I think you were talking about, for you, how time intensive that was. Yeah, we, we did that for a while. That, that was how we started. Now, we didn't keep a paper copy. We kept a digital copy of it, um, of a screenshot, and we realized very quickly that we were missing a lot of data. So, for example, without – without uh, expanding the comments, because as Anil said, comments can come in at any time. So we may do a screenshot of all of the comments today. As soon as we're done with that, somebody may comment on that, and we may not archive that again doing it that way. Uh, very time consuming. We missed a lot of stuff. Uh, to include stuff that was deleted, we would miss also. And Anil, I will uh, pitch in on that as well. Sure. I, I think Lieutenant Green covered it. Uh, uh, one of the biggest problems there is, and we've heard this from, from agency after agency that we've worked with, is that w while they were screenshotting, that was the best they could do. I, I actually applaud you for the effort you put in there because some record is better than no record. Um, they admitted to themselves eventually that it was incomplete. It was taking a lot of time to have an incomplete record, both from missing content, but also, as I talked about, metadata. Uh, taking that screenshot is not going to have that metadata. In Arizona and the state of Washington, this is the only two times I'm aware of that electronic records have been challenged in regards to metadata being a part of the public record. In both cases, those two different states rule that metadata is part of the public record. So it's incomplete. And the last thing I'll ask you is, uh, if you have these screenshots and you're doing it on a regular basis, over time, how do you manage that? How do you search it? It's really hard to search a screenshot to find information. And so ultimately, it's going to be a lot of investment up front uh, and it may not even pay off when you need it. Yeah, guys, just a lot of complexity here, but that's the whole purpose of today's webinar is to help demystify this. Hey, uh, we've got a quick shout-out. By the way, thank you, Kim Christensen, Vernon Hills Police Department. This is not a question, just a thank you, so thank you as well. Um, real quick question, too, wants to know if um, somebody is going to be attending uh, the National Information Officers uh, Association Conference in Nashville next month. Either you, uh, Andy, or Neil going to be there? I am not going to be there. However, I would love to. And on uh, yeah, on our archive social side, we we recently found out about this association from a number of agencies we work with, and we are going to be there. We signed up last minute, and a colleague of mine, uh, Ken Walters, will be there. And I'll tell you, guys, as you know, Nashville is a great place. Got to go uh, listen to the music down there. So, hey, we've got a great question here from Haida Sloan, Hillier Division of Police, uh, again, for both of you. She said, if your records retention filed with the state indicates that social media is only kept until it is no longer needed or outdated, is there a law? She said, what law states that law enforcement still needs to be retained? I guess this gets into a policy and a records retention issue. Andy, how are you guys handling that? And then, Anil, what have you seen and what's a good practice? Uh we're not having that issue that way. Uh, we've what the guidance that came out of the law department for us is that we are keeping all of our social media data on our uh, record retention schedule, and they selected the time frame of two years for our data, and that was based on where it, where it fit in with other similar types of data. Um, other than that, I don't know of any other law that's requiring you to retain it beyond that. If that's the question. So, yeah, I'll chime in on that. This has come up a few times. Uh, if you look at the, the law, uh, and again, I'm not an attorney, so that's the first thing I'll do is disclaim that and say that you should talk to your attorney and then at, at the state level, whether it's the Secretary of State's office or the, uh, the state archives, whoever's managing it there in Ohio, to get their view. But what we've seen is that the, the law at a, high, at a high level in the state of, of Ohio or any state that we work with, 
the spirit of the law is about retaining content uh, based on the nature of that content. Again, is it a crime tip? Is it a citizen complaint? Or is it administrative in value? And that should apply across the board regardless of physical form. Now, I know in your local jurisdiction, you can then determine, you're then given the power many times to, to, to then construct your own retention policy. But I think you should, you should think really, really carefully about social media, uh, not throw it into a single bucket that says, hey, we're only going to keep social media for 30 days or 60 days and, and, and basically pretend that there's nothing important happening, happening on social media. Because as we've seen time and time again, whether it's a very small scale emergency or crime or a large one that, that makes national news, you will need to use social media to communicate important issues, important topics. Hopefully, you're able to use it on a daily basis to answer some questions. And so, you know, you want your retention policy to, to really relay the spirit of how you're using that, that, that channel. And you don't want to be challenged on it. What's going to happen if somebody does challenge you and take you to court and say, wait a minute, you're throwing away all the social media content or you're not retaining it, acting like it's not important, but here you are requesting crime tips and communicating, you know, during, during a flood. Um, so that's what you want to avoid from, from the get-go. Yeah, and look, uh, guys, we have so many more questions to get to, but unfortunately we are out of time. Uh, just last thing is uh, thank you. Um, David Fillmore, Branch County, said thanks for all the great information. Yeah, thank you to Anil and to Andy for the great information here, folks, today. So I want to be respectful of our one-hour commitment. So we will have to wrap it up here. First thing I want to do is thank our sponsor for today and our good corporate partner who's always been there, Archive Social, for helping us put these things on. A big thank you. Go to my fellow speakers, uh, fellow Sheepdog, Lieutenant Andy Green, and then Anil Chavla. And then a special thanks again, like I said, to our partners at Archive Social. Just remember, within 48 hours, you're going to get a link to the recording. Uh, you can download the slides. Make sure, please, please, please fill out the survey. This is how we improve everything. So I want to thank everybody, you folks in law enforcement, especially you folks in Ohio, this coming weekend. Make sure you stay safe where your Kevlar and uh, go home sh safe at the end of your shift. So thanks again, everybody. We look forward to seeing you again at another government technology event. Everybody have a great day.